This is the dining room for the first floor of the China Harbor restaurant where I will be presenting today. As you can see, it faces the Union Bay, Seattle's Union Bay. Uh, so it's a very nice view of the Union Bay. So I wanted to give this presentation because the announcement was made in October by Apple's um, Jennifer Bailey, who runs Apple Pay. She, knit, she made an announcement that Apple would now be accepted at Starbucks. Howard Schultz then went out and made the same statement. This is a tectonic shift for mobile payments, not just in the United States, but around the world. Let me explain further. So this is Howard Schultz, and Howard Schultz basically wanted to create a mobile payment initiative for the company. So they started very basically. They started in 2009 to make a simple app. They outsourced the development of that app to a company called M Foundry. Then they migrated to, wow, look at that, they started using Blackberries. So they started using Blackberries for their mobile payment initiative because they, they knew about security. Then they started to work in the Target stores because Target stores had Starbucks. Finally, after that, they decided uh, to create a loyalty program. That's in 2010, they had a loyalty card. I had the loyalty card for China when I was working in Beijing. In 2012, they decided to invest in Square. And I said to myself, wow, that's a stupid mistake. I, 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 I gave a presentation in Hong Kong in 2013. I said, in 18 months, if, if Square doesn't migrate to NFC, they will be gone. Square, this company called Square. So they had a relationship with Square, but that ended it this year, 2015. Um, in addition, they were using barcode, um, and that's not safe, it's not secure. It is just simply not safe. David will tell you that. Um, by 2013, they started to develop their own cool mobile wallet app that you could download and use. I use it, it's great. But at that isn't, Starbucks mobile wallet app is not Apple Pay. That's not Apple Pay. Oh, by the way, Starbucks is all over China. There are probably 1,500 stores now in China for Apple Pay. That's a lot, but actually that doesn't even scratch the surface. Would you say that the Chinese people like Starbucks? Would you make that? Come on. Who has not been to China and who has not used app, who has not used the Starbucks? Who has not been to China? First of all, who has not been to China? Okay, okay. Who has been to China? Who has been in a Starbucks store in China? See, look at that. I proved my point. All right, now, I have the audio, but I'm not gonna show, I'm not gonna take my word for it. This is Jennifer Bailey. She made a statement that Starbucks would support Apple Pay. That got my brain thinking because I remember the statement that I made in 2009. I said in 2009, because I'm the guy who was promoting NFC, I was, I was the rainmaker to promote this technology to all the smartphone manufacturers in Taiwan and China. In 2009, I made a prediction. I said, because I looked at the market and I saw all these conferences and people would just say, blah, 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 NFC is great. Oh my God, come on, lots of propaganda, okay? Uh, and, I, and I didn't feel that it was important to sens sensationalize this stuff when um, the average person doesn't want that, they want facts, they want figures. Okay, so I made a statement, I said 2009, the only way that mobile payments would scale for ubiquity was if, number one, Apple would adopt NFC and hence a mobile payment capability on their smartphones, a secure mobile payment initiative. Number two, uh, the Starbucks would have to adopted into their stores for point of sale using NFC. Now that's easier said than done. It still hasn't been done yet. Even they, they made the announcement in October. And even EMV standard, the whole global, the whole America liability shift to use chip and pin and chip and signature credit cards. We're here, it's already happened. 
But even the point of sale in, in, in the China Harbor restaurant is still using the old non-NFC standard. Okay, the third thing that has to happen, which hasn't happened yet, but there's lots of rumors, is that the IATA, the International Airline Transportation Authority, needs to adopt the use of NFC in the smartphone, or maybe an ID card, okay, or a passport. Guess what, by the way, NFC is already in your passports. David knows that. NFC is in your passports, and nobody told you, right? Did you know that there's a chip in your, in your passport? What is it used for? Nothing right now. Anyway, the International Airline Transportation Authority or Association needs to adopt a 19-point plan that was uh, put into play, um, and Air France has been trialing it, number one. Apple has an application salivating, waiting for it to happen. Once that happens, then mobile payments, not just in America, but globally, will be ubiquitous. We all drink tea or coffee. We all buy the iPhone. Yeah, well, I people. And uh, we all take planes. But it's not just planes, it's subways. We have the Orca card here in Sound Transit, right? The Orca card, we use that for subways, we can use that for the ferries. And that will be used ubiquitously, the NFC technology. All right, let me migrate on. See, see, not, not so much technology. This is Apple's, this, I'm sorry, this is Starbucks China mobile app. You have to download it, and you also have to have a loyalty card in China first to use it. So if you don't have either of those, forget it. It's, it's a very painful experience. Okay. Did you know that Apple Pay has been in America one year? But did you also know that as of August, Apple Pay has been in the Starbucks in the UK. Oh, nobody told you, right? It's a fact. It's a fact. Where is Starbucks and Apple salivating to get more payment uh, and more profits? China, hello, there you go. Um, this is a funny joke. Did you realize that Starbucks lattes are the most expensive in China? It's more expensive than any place else in the world. And they, and CCTV, CCTV the, the propaganda um, the news show for China, you know, was wanted to criticize Starbucks. And so they said, look, look at how expensive Starbucks is. And Starbucks came back and they said, hey, hey, it's not us. We break down the labor costs. It's the cost of distribution in China that makes the Starbucks so expensive. It's just expensive to ship things in China, the logistics, the gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this person basically said, you CCTV, would you shut up? We spend more money for gas than any place else in the world. We, our, our houses are the most expensive in the world. Our, I mean, we pay so much money for uh, all of our goods. Our milk is not safe. A lot of our food is not safe. And you're complaining about a few dollars more for Starbucks? Hey, get a life. I'm gonna go into Starbucks and use my free Wi-Fi. So basically, Starbucks has been able to overcome the protectionism and the somewhat techno-nationalism of China because Starbucks is good and the Wi-Fi is free. And everybody that goes into the Starbucks and uses the Wi-Fi uses WeChat and makes phone calls free of charge. Hello, mobile network operators. You have a problem. Okay, move on. Okay, um, I will talk a little bit about mobile device uh, ecosystem and security. Basically, um, this presentation is not about security, but I want to tell you that if, if, unless you're using the Apple iPhone, you have no security on your smartphones. Unless you're using Apple or Blackberry, the fruit sounding companies, unless you're using those smartphones, you do not have security. You might think you do. You might think you have privacy and security. You don't. You don't. These are all the breaches that can occur in a typical mobile ecosystem. The chip vendors, the operating system vendors, the apps developers, these guys, these guys aren't part of the United Nations um, morality and ethics organization uh, for developers, are they? You hear the word hackers all the time, ethical hackers, black hackers, unethical hackers. 
Hackers are hackers, okay? There's always a motive and an initiative to do what they do. David is kind of, David is a little, uh, he's got other comments, anyway. Um, so how it works is the smartphones use the technology and then they sell it to the MNOs and the mobile network operators and then they sell that to the, the various markets. But there's security breaches all along this which makes it very difficult. Apple owns that whole ecosystem. Did you know that your Apple iPhone 6 SIM card does not come from the mobile network operators? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> your mobile, your SIM card on the Apple iPhone 6 does not come from the operators. David, is that correct? I didn't know that. It comes from <laughs> Apple, and Apple provisions that and puts it in the SIM card with the operator's permission, and then they sell you the iPhone. Because Apple was promoting something called soft SIM, which means they want the ability to have the SIM card in the Apple um, iPhone and tablet, and then you just go to any operator you want, and you provision the mobile payment profile, download it into the, into the I mean, that, that's how it works with the iPad mini with the, with the SIM card now. That's how it works right now. You didn't know that. Oh. You can say you learned something today. All right, we move forward. Do you, do you realize that there's this whole, what I call the spin, uh, basically the, the wheel of mobile payment fortunes. I call it the holy grail of mobile payments. I talked to this group a little bit about that, how Apple has their Apple Pay and their Passbook, which is their mobile wallet, now their smart watch as well. Google has their wallet, and they used um, Simply Tap for this thing called host card emulation, which is emulating a payment token in the cloud. Gets, it's not really in the cloud, the cloud's right over there. It's not really in the cloud, it's on a server, and that server is secure, and it gets provisioned back down into the open operating system of the smartphone as a token, and they're using host card emulation to do that. There's a company in Redmond run by Uncle Bill who does the same thing, is planning to do the same thing. I want. People here remember who first told you that Microsoft has a plan to launch a nationwide payment platform using host card emulation NFC. But Lord knows this fragmented company up over there in Redmond, if they can ever get their act together to do what they want to do. Um, this is the, their plan. Now, this is also the plan of Android Pay with Google. It's also the plan for Samsung. And it is not the, pay, the plan for Apple. Apple does not provision their mobile payment data in the cloud. It's, it's not done in the cloud. But Android, Google, Samsung, Microsoft, they're all using the cloud. They will all use the cloud and something called host card emulation. Um, okay, that wasn't too technical, right? So, do you realize there are two types of payments? I hear people tell me, oh, I know all about payment. I was saying, do you really? There are two types of payments. <clears throat> there are two types of payments. Generally speaking, there are four types, but you need to know about two types. Proximity payments, that's where I take my smartphone. I take my smartphone, I have a point of sale device at the Starbucks. I take my Apple Pay and I touch, or I get within four centimeters, I touch the point of sale device to make my mobile payment using NFC and my mobile wallet in my Starbucks, my, my Starbucks app and my mobile wallet um, app uh, and my Apple NFC technology, even my biometrics thumb to do the whole authentication process. Okay, that kind of, that process is what we call proximity payment. You're there, right there doing the payment. You have to be within four, they say 10 centimeters, I've never seen 10 centimeters. You have to be within four centimeters to do that, okay? That's what we call proximity. We call that proximity, but we call it offline payment, which means nothing happens until your smartphone gets close. Nothing happens. Alipay, 10 cent, QQ, they're doing the other thing. They're doing what we call online remote money transfer. You might say, well, it's not remote, I'm right there. But they're using barcode they're using a mobile wallet and barcode, but you, you top up the payment. You, you have to pay into that. 
and it's all actually already online. So it's not offline, it's online. So that's what we call online payment. So that's what Alipay is. WeChat, WeChat, and QQ, they're doing online payment in China and other parts of the world right now. So there are two different types of payment. Of course, there's, a, there's another variant of that where uh, consumer to business, where mobile devices use pulses and they transfer information, and then there's a remote online payments, e-commerce, digital products. Focus on these two things, online and offline payment, remote and proximity payment. Those are the things to remember as we move forward. All right, uh, this is just very simple. There's the merchant, I wanna buy something, here I am, I send my credit card, they send my details to their bank, I authenticate with my credit card to my bank, <clears throat> there's a guy sitting in the middle, this guy in the middle says, uh-huh, he's got the money, he's not, a, he's not a terrorist, he's got the money, he's legal, give him the ability to transfer those funds. It can't get any simpler than that, that's how, those are the four components in a mobile payment, or any kind of credit card transaction. Um, okay, I said this before, but you realize that the Orca card technology is in the University of Washington student ID. Who's here from University of Washington? Who has used that student ID? Have you used that? You've used these, the uh, contactless? Yeah, the card, so they've got the pass, so they got what you so they just use the card, and then you just pay them for the public transportation. Fantastic, fantastic. Why didn't Starbucks, why didn't Microsoft build a mobile wallet for that. Hello, Bill. Can you hear me? Oh, no, no. Hello, Nadia. Uh, Nadia, Nadia. Um, Nadella, Nadella. Um, please, see what's going on in your environment. There are so many applications that can be developed using NFC for payment, for ticketing, for transit, for all kinds of things that aren't happening now, why? Because we're ignorant and arrogant that the rest of the world is moving forward and we're not moving fast enough. It's a fact, it is a fact. Okay, so NFC means near field communications, it doesn't mean national football conference, it doesn't mean, mean no functional clue, it doesn't mean uh, not for commerce, it does mean near field communications which basically is a master-slave situation where it's what we call induction. Induction occurs when I take my smartphone, with, which has NFC in the smartphone, and also NFC in the point of sale device, and I touch it, and something happens. Many things can happen. It isn't just payment that happens. If you look here, they're using it for, this is sound transit, right? They're using it for that. They're using it to open doors in offices, right? They're using it for time and attendance. You're an employee, remember? Remember, like 30 years ago, we used to have a punch card for employment, oh my god. Now you just have a badge, you touch an NFC, to uh, NFC reader, and then they know when you've gone into your office. Everybody should be using that. Um, smart posters, wow, it's so cool. If, okay, you're from France? Have you gone up from the subway and then you take your smartphone and touch the poster? Isn't that cool, huh? It's, it's amazing, um, and it's not here yet. It's coming. I've seen it in the United States. David, you've probably seen it. I've seen smart posters in the United States. Maybe not here yet, but there's a company called Blue Ant. I want to do some research. They're doing this stuff. Um, ticketing. Okay, I'm at the, I, I, last night I got the distinct opportunity to see the new 007 movie. I was very lucky. I got in, got, a, got some popcorn. I was able to see the movie with a friend. Um, I'm just thinking to myself, they, I could have just downloaded the mobile app with NFC and just touched to get in. I didn't need to get some special token. That would have worked. Loyalty and membership. Well, that's what Starbucks is doing. Starbucks has a plan with Apple that we all don't know yet. Um, cashless payments. This is the whole mobile payment thing we talked about. PC login. When I worked at Jamalto, we all needed our badge, and our badge had a smart chip, and that smart chip you inserted into your PC. Otherwise, you were not going to use your PC. So, um, <laughs> why don't security companies use that technology? Jamalto does, but a lot of security companies. They have a, an off-the-counter off, off PC and they're transferring sensitive data uh, unencrypted and hello, Houston, we really have a problem. Um, and of course, identification. This is really cool because I predict one day, university, I predict one day 
uh, Washington State will have um, contact and contactless uh, identification cards for your, your driver's license. And connecting that will be your sound transit card. It'll all be connected one day. When somebody invests enough vision into this, this is going to happen. It's going to happen. It's happening. If it can happen in Nigeria, why can't it happen here? All right, move forward. This is not vision and vaporware. This is the 19-point plan that Apple is waiting for IATA to put into play. You can see, you walk into the airport, it covers the security, covers uh, when you get out of the airport, it covers the car rental, car unlocking, covers everything including your hotel. Check this organization, CITA. This is the organization pushing for the standards, standardization of this technology in the, air, in the airports. Um, tokenization, uh, toke, uh, sorry, loyalty programs, Starbucks is going to work with Apple. I don't know whose loyalty program, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but I'm guessing that Apple's just going to give way and say, okay, Starbucks, you're so successful, we'll use your loyalty program, we'll standardize on your loyalty program. Why not? Why not? Starbucks is so successful. This is a bit interesting in that the current situation is we have Apple Pay. We know Apple Pay is around, and that's right here where they're using the physical, um, actually SIM-based solution uses the physical SIM card, right? This is what ISIS and SoftCard were promoting, but that's now dead until Google makes a statement that is now dead. Really, you, you walk into an operator store and you say, I want mobile payment, they'll tell you to buy Apple Pay. You say, I'm an Android phone, they don't, Android phone, deer in the headlights, they don't know what to tell you. They, I mean, David, you're right, am I correct? They don't know what to tell you. Um, now, Apple Pay is cool because the secure element is not in the SIM card anymore. It's embedded in a controller chip, you see? It's in a controller chip that you don't touch. You don't even care about it, it's there. And um, you, Apple owns that, and they control that, all right? And it's supported by Visa, MasterCard, Amex. Everybody's going to support this. And it uses a token. I'll explain what tokens are very quickly. But as I mentioned before, Samsung is doing the same thing, embedded secure element, and they have NFC technology, and they're working with the same partners. Ah, but they've got this, um, at least for the United States, for Europe everywhere, they've got this MST, this Magnetic Secure Transaction Technology, which just works, it's cool. It works in 80% of all the point of sale devices right now. So if you have a Google Android smartphone, I would buy Samsung because they have this MST, the newest version of their phones. They bought the technology from a company in Boston called Lu uh, Loop, um, run by a Seattle guy who moved to Boston called Will Grayland, actually Chinese uh, guy. I don't know why his name is Graydon. Anyway, uh, he's in Boston, and he sold that for $25 million to Samsung this year. And so Samsung phones are really cool because they have, you don't, you don't have to take your credit card out with the Samsung, the newest version of the Samsung Galaxy phones. Um, this is cool because we don't know what Apple's, what, what Android's really gonna do, what Google's really gonna do. We know there's a Google Wallet, it's still around. We know host card emulation is gonna be used for the banks. We know, I know, I know that you're working on that right now. Cough it up. You wanna get your 15 minutes of fame? No. <laughs> See, notice he, he didn't say yes, he didn't say no. He didn't say anything. Every bank is working on host card emulation, HCE, NFC, because they know that Microsoft's gonna use this technology trying to make their own nationwide mobile payment platform. Samsung's using the same technology. Android is using the same technology. Alibaba and Alipay will use the same technology, as will China Union Pay, as will all the Taiwanese banks. Hong Kong, not sure yet. So this host card emulation is interesting technology. It, it provides a payment token from the cloud back down to the smartphone for you to use. And it's secure because the token is not your credit card. If somebody steal it, steals it, they're not really stealing that much. They can still steal sensitive information, but they're stealing a token. It has a limited use and life, a limited usage for somebody, for a hacker. 
So it's not like stealing your credit card details. It is different. David, I know you have some comments. You can. Um, this is a bit too technical, but um, I want to uh, just show you something here. These are what you call smart cards. Can you pass this around? These smart cards are made up the whole basis for security for credit card and, um, and even really the SIM card and this smart card technology, it's basically the same thing. Uh, it's basically the same thing. So uh, I, I'm not gonna go through this very, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this. There are smart cards, there are secure elements. This is how you get to the security of these smartphones. I'll go quickly. You need an NFC phone. An NFC phone needs an antenna, needs an NFC SIM card, uh, and it needs the operating system to support it. Again, very quickly, it's too technical. We don't need that. What we do need to know about is the NFC forum has, did you know that you can do, there are three different modes for NFC, which are really cool. That's that poster uses what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. That's the poster mode. The mobile payment mode is what we call um, card emulation mode. It's emulating a credit card. And then the read-write mode is getting a nice little tag where you can put a tag and then you can uh, tag an item and then put your smartphone in and read it. So there are three modes in NFC. They're all actually important. Apple is not using the three modes. Samsung is, but Apple is not yet. They will. Um, this is kind of cool. It shows how Apple Pay payment flow occurs. So add the card, you, you have the capability for payments, and then your authentication. You use Touch ID, which is using biometric authentication um, format. It's an algorithm. That algorithm actually is stored inside of the mobile apps processor chip. You can't get to it. It's using something called ARM Trust Zone. You cannot get to it. It's secure. It stores your data. In the future, in the future, your biometric data will be worth gold because you can now authenticate without a reasonable, without a question, who you are. When you want to make a payment, when you want to get a mortgage from a house, oh, this is be, this is very very big because this changes the whole paradigm with the credit card industry. When you when your biometric authentication data can now completely authenticate you. Your eyes, your face, your heartbeat, your blood through the DNA. Oh, you think this is the, you think this is the matrix? Think again. Think again. They'll use multiple authentication factors based on your body. Then they know it's really you. No way to clone you, really. I mean, not yet anyway. Um, uh, this is what I talked to you about using the mobile payments in the cloud and bypassing the SIM card and bringing it straight to the cloud to provision your token. But uh, again, let me, let, me go, let me get away from this because this is a bit too technical. I just wanted to say that the future of a smartphone is what? The mobile network operators are not going away. They're gonna be around. They're gonna still use the SIM card. SIM card is gonna be around for at least five more years. It's not going away for at least five more years. Therefore, when you buy a mobile payment smartphone, it will still have a SIM card. You will still have the opportunity to put your mobile payment SIM card and, you, and you use, do payment that way. But the cloud, using the cloud and host card emulation technology and tokens is the wave of the future. Everybody's doing it. So the future is a hybrid smartphone using both. My prediction is Apple will adopt HCE because they have to. All the other guys are doing it. And they have an advantage. They have an advantage. Uh, too technical, this is just talking about how it works. I'm gonna skip this. That kind of explains how it happens. Your secure element and your token data gets sent back down to the open operating system to be ready for the payment. It's that simple, it uses cloud services. Token is basically, it's a number that's given by Visa, MasterCard, Amex on your credit card, and it's scrambled. 
and scrambled into something totally different so it has no value to a hacker. I, I don't know if I can make it any simpler than that. Um, and there are standards for that, and that's the EMB standard at the point of sale, which needs to be ready for these tokens. So the point of sale needs to be ready. PCI, PCS, yes, has to have that. But in addition to that, it has to be ready for the token from EMB Co. EMB Co is the organization that uh, standardizes the, uh, the token that's used. HC just gets the token from the cloud back to the handset. But once it's on the handset, it's ready and provisioned for the point of sale. Uh, this is a very simple way of showing how Android, Microsoft, Samsung do it with a token and how Apple is doing it. Again, Apple is using tokens, but they're not using the cloud to do that. The, pro the token gets sent down into the embedded secure element. It's a little bit different. Uh, this is just using EMV type payment cryptograms. Cryptograms are encrypted keys that store your payment data so nobody can steal it. That's what it is. It's a secure encrypted key. Encryption technology. These are, if you look at a lot of these, this was, I gave this presentation last year, and all these companies were non-Apple pay uh, retailers and merchants. Well, you can see, they're now part of Apple Pay, they're part of Apple Pay, they're part of Apple Pay, who else? You can see what's going on here. They all know Apple Pay is safe and secure. Uh, this is China related, so if you're, if you're interested in China related stuff, this is important. So, Alibaba and Alipay are very successful in China. Uh, China Union Pay does not like that. And in fact, the, the China Union Pay does not like Jack Ma. But we all like Jack, because Jack's put an office here in Seattle and he's hiring lots of Chinese engineers for his Seattle office and he's making Amazon shake a little. That's kind of cool. But his mobile wallet is not safe and it's not secure, basically. That's why China Union Pay said, you will not promote barcode-based mobile payment wallet technology in China. They tried to ban it. China Union Pay tried to ban this in China this year, or late last year. Uh, but Jack's got a lot of friends. And I was in Starbucks, seven, uh, I was in 7-Eleven store, uh, and Alipay, WeChat, and QQ, Mobile wallet technologies are still being used in uh, at least 7-Eleven and other stores. So Jack wins. That's because China Union Pay, like China Mobile, like China Telecom, like China Unicom, are state-owned enterprises and they're very old dying dragons. They're not creative, they're not innovative like Jack is. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to get political, but <laughs> Jack is making some people nervous. Um, Jack wants to make his own bank. He's working on that, and he's working on using HC and NFC to do that. Ah, so Jack's in the ball game. Jack is in safe Cofield. You just don't know where he's sitting. Um, this is Tencent and Alipay. They're competing back and forth for everything. Ali, um, Alibaba buys this technology. Tencent says, I'm gonna buy the technology. It's Tencent against Alibaba in China. These are the two largest online e-retailers uh, in China. Uh, I don't have to tell you that Jack is pitching e-commerce, which is really not e-commerce. All these reporters, they have it wrong. There's no such thing as e-commerce in China. It's m-commerce. People are making payments in China on their tablet and their smartphone. Only very few Chinese people can afford a, an Apple Mac Pro in a Starbucks, because I see them. And there are very few of those, but that's where you find them, in Starbucks, because those are very expensive. Um, they will make online payments with their PC, but everybody's using their tablet or smartphone to make payments in China, so it's a little bit different than you might think. So there's no, it's not e-commerce, it's m-commerce, number one. 
But M Commerce to do payments is still remote payment and not proximity payment. More money will be made with this kind of proximity payment than remote payment. I don't sit in my house all day long thinking about what to buy online. I'm taking the subway. I might want to buy a coffee in the subway. I might go to lunch. I might use my NFC smartphone to make all of that payment purchase. You see the point here? You see the point? Microsoft's in that same dream as is Amazon. They're all in the wrong dream. They're all in, let's buy something online um, with my credit card or my remote payment. They're not, they're missing the key point, which is all the things for proximity payment are what we call lifestyle applications. Lifestyle. So, don't worry, I'll be speaking Chinese sooner or later. Um, this is kind of cool because everybody, people tell me, Baratong, Baratong. I know about Baratong. I'm talking to them, I've been talking to them about security for a number of years. So here's the thing. The most successful transit car in the world is in Hong Kong. Not, not South Korea, not Japan. Because those populations are huge compared to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has officially 7 million people. Unofficially, they have 10 million Badatong transit cards. Hello. I have one too. I've had one for 10 years. So it's very, very successful. But actually in Taiwan, they're using yo yo ka. Taiwan has a very similar card. And in Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, they also have their own cards. We call them value-added transit cards. With those value-added transit cards, it's a card. It's not a smartphone, but it's still convenient, and you can make purchases of small goods, drinks in the subway, although don't go in the subway with your drink. Um, but you can eat food, you can take food uh, in the subway using that. You can even, you can even use Baratong at Hong Kong International Starbucks. Bingo. Bingo, bingo. There you go. So there are ways that some countries have gotten around the lack of mobile payment by first getting the payment ubiquitous with the card at various stores. The next step is the smartphone. So it's, it's all migrating to that. Uh, Android Pay. Okay, so this is a fact. Chinese government, especially China Union Pay, is blocking Apple Pay right now. They're blocking it from uh, adoption in China. Well, Apple Pay is a very smart company. They've already announced that they have their own company in China to do Apple Pay, even though China Union Pay has not approved them yet. I don't know how they can stop them. The problem is, is in China, 80% of the smartphone manufacturers use Android operating system. So everyone's waiting for Android Pay in China. Uh, the problem is Android Pay is not safe and secure because it's using HC and NFC and in the cloud. And that is not secure without another technology uh, called ARM Trust Zone and this thing called the TEE. In Chinese, it's Kexing Zhixing Huanjing. We can talk later. So Apple Pay will be in China. You can't stop it. Um, it's not that Union Pay is stopping it. It's just that Apple wants more profit for Apple Pay in China. And the Chinese government says, no, no, no. Apple says, well, I have a way around you. And they do. And they will implement Apple Pay in China. It's going to happen. It will happen. With or without President Xi Jinping giving his holy grail approval, it's going to happen in China. It will happen. Um, but I can understand Union Pay just wants all these Chinese handset makers with Android Pay to compete with Apple Pay, right? That's the ball game. Apple Pay is competing with all these other companies. All right, that's enough of that. A little bit political. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, but I'm not politically correct. Um, Seattle is the key location. Is one of the key locations for the development of contactless mobile NFC payment smartphones. Did you know that we have Huawei? ZTE and HTC, or well, HTC is Taiwanese. Did you realize we have three smartphone manufacturers in this region from China? Did you know that? Did you? You, you didn't? How come you didn't know? Huawei, Huawei. ZTE, Zhongxin, and HTC, Hongda. We are there. They're all next to T Mobile in Bellevue. 
Okay. And the mobile network operators are all involved in this whole mobile payment initiative. They're just quiet right now. And NFC wallet, wallet development is happening at Starbucks, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. They're all working on this right now. They're just not telling you that these are just secrets because they're not ready, they're not finished. So this region is actually very important for software mobile wallet development. It absolutely is. Seattle is the portal to the Pacific. You ever go on I-90? That's what it says. Going into Seattle to Puget Sound, what does it say? Portal to the Pacific. What does that mean? The fact is, this is the Pacific for mobile payment technologies are coming here. That's what's actually going on. Smartphone vendors, the smart card companies, they're coming from Asia here. That's what's happening, all right? So the US needs to partner. You guys need to think about this, partnering with all these software developers here in the region. Get them on track. Um, now finally, Starbucks adoption of Apple Pay and usage, and usage of NFC and biometric authentication that's the security part of it. For mobile payments will help to scale ubiquitously um, the, mo the whole mobile payment environment. And as I mentioned, that David mentioned as well, do you realize that your credit card is also contactless? You just touch the top of the point of sale device. Why don't we see enough of those? We don't see them there because people don't realize they actually exist. Go anywhere in Asia, they're all over Asia. That is my presentation. Uh, and I'll take questions now. Do we have time?